I think it'd be hard pressed to find in my craft, which is politics, a larger failure in maybe the entire history of humanity than the political failure around the environment. Uh, you know, there has been no greater disconnect in human history between science and public policy than there is today, which is ironic since we are the most educated, technology savvy, healthiest, uh, more aware generation than any other in human history. We have more data, more technology to understand the granular nuances of changes in our environment. And we may go down as a generation in human history uh, that most disengaged from reality uh, to live in uh, an environmental bubble that it would hard, be hard to define anything as a collective commitment to insanity. Um, it is fascinating to me to watch the difficulty that many of us have in politics, and I'm in a very mainstream political party, the Liberal Party, to actually find space to stand and fight on these things. We've seen the largest expansion of wind and solar energy and thermal energy and green technology in Ontario. Clean technology now employs 60,000 people, 3,000 businesses, uh, generates $8 billion in, uh, in GDP. Uh, and our big costs in Ontario were not generated from the 3% of our energy that comes from green. It comes from the cost of nuclear, which is the singular most expensive form of energy. Um, The, it, it's also interesting just to watch that we've just elected a national government who recently, in the last year, laid off 700 scientists and staff at Environment Canada, the largest disinvestment in environment, and just collapsed and wrapped up uh, Robert, Robert uh, 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 Page, who had to, headed up the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy after the um, brilliant scientist, someone who came from the oil sector, interestingly enough, a passionate, intelligent, very moderate person, who was to be the last chair of the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy, which was set up ironically by Brian Mulroney uh, to ensure that there was independent political advice, because he felt uh, at the time that environmental questions were so fundamental uh, that the public service uh, could not generate internally the kind of depth and breadth of research. Uh, so the National Roundtable the Environment and the Economy uh, became the steward to ensure that our cabinet ministers in Ottawa were well informed independently and could get a critical independent view of science and environmental science and help uh, compile data and facts into coherent public policy uh, uh, options for the government. Well, you know, if you don't believe in climate change, you certainly don't want to see any evidence that it might be happening lying around. So the National Roundtable and the Environment and the Economy no longer exists. Um, and, and that's not a partisan attack, because I, 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 you know, as my friend Elizabeth May pointed out, we've had conservative governments in Canada that have been very engaged in this issue, uh, and very positively so. Uh, so it's with great sadness. So here we are as Canadians, uh, you know, and people often get into these really bizarre political analysis, well, we're only two and a half percent of the world's population, it's not our responsibility. Well, you know, the solutions to climate change aren't going to come out of Chad, or Niger, or Iran. You know, we are, we are a first world country which has the best universities and the best scientists in the world and more capital and more resources than any other. Our grandparents couldn't have imagined the kind of world we lived in when my grandmother came to Canada, to Hamilton in 1908 and looked around and saw this huge burning industrial complex that was emerging out of that. And we became the most, arguably for a country at the time, we probably went from five to 30 million people over the last century one of the most successful industrial economies in the world. And that inheritance uh, from our parents should ask us to pause and ask what, as you are asking, what is the legacy to our children and grandchildren? And why are we so incompetent collectively as a generation? In 1926, our parents, our grandparents, or those of those generation, lived on 1 16th of the energy that we use. By 1956, 19, into the late, when I was born in the late 50s, they used one-eighth the amount of energy. We use eight times more energy today than when I was born. I don't remember the 60s as being a terribly horrible decade in our lives. Uh, 
we drove cars, we did all kinds of things we still do today, but with one eighth of the energy. Um, and as our population grows and we continue to be voracious consumers of energy, uh, that excess consumption is unresolvable. Uh, it is an inequity generationally that robs our children and soils the inheritance that we have. You cannot, unless you want to go down the, the road that so many right-wing politicians want to take us down, where they've reclassified us. When was the last time we heard a mayor or a leader refer to us as citizens? I get a gag reflex now when I get called a consumer. <laughs> Especially since the problem is we live with a level of excess consumption to start to talk to people, or a taxpayer. Tax pay is a function that we do. It is part of our responsibility because we don't like raw sewage in our rivers and lakes and we don't like ignorant, you know, impoverished children who can't get a public education. I mean, we've actually collectively invested in the things that we cannot do ourselves in our homes. Uh, but there's been a detachment from that. Uh, I always get very suspicious when I hear uh, politicians talk about us in ways other than citizens. Uh, my grandmother came to Canada not to be a taxpayer. She reminded me they didn't pay taxes in Eastern Europe at the time. Uh, they just raped, pillaged, and had civil wars that, in her case, killed her entire family. Uh, taxes didn't seem like such a horrible thing at this point, but it's, it's, it's now a four-letter word. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to me to see the dynamic that's uh, developed around that, given what a small amount of our net wealth and prosperity that most of us own, for those of us who have been part of the larger part of Canadian society that have it, we're asked to give back to the collective good. I mean, it is hardly onerous if you went back in time and sat across from your grandmother or your father. Most of them would tell you our standard of living collectively is much better and individually it hasn't compromised our entrepreneurial individual spirit. We still very much have that uh, very richly. Um, so it is that dynamic. So I think the, the question is, is how does our generation live within the mean, with, within the same means and constraints that our parents and grandparents did? I mean, we're not being asked to, you know, walk naked in January and give up our homes and live without food. Uh, it, we're, we're asked to be smarter. It was fascinating watching us here in Toronto in the, la the last civic election. Uh, while well, the war on the car came to an end. I, I marked the first passing of that event last year by becoming a carless household. Uh, we have no automobiles in our hands. Because it was a very simple question. It wasn't about what other people did. I, I, I grew up as a guilt-ridden Anglican, sorry to the Baptist present, you know, where I was taught that at the end of every day, you pray for the people you love and yourself, and you try to reconcile yourself to God. And to me, I'm, not, I'm, I'm an anti-evangelical. I have a great deal of problems with evangelicals of all sides. You know, the whole Rick Santorum thing just you know, made my hair stand up, you know, that we are somehow, we, we see nature through the cellophane wrap, wrapping on the you know, pork tenderloins at the local uh, uh, you know, Loblaw store because our entire role in the world is to dominate all the species and everything else is simply a food source for us. Um, very interesting kind of theology, but anyway, that seemed to have its day. But I say that in a sense because it's those core values of what is our relationship to nature that is, is pretty fundamental. Uh, and how do we live our lives? And do we see other species as, as having value as something greater than a food source? That we're actually part of a complex ecology of biodiversity of which our relationships are more complex and interdependent. If you go through that process and then you look at what your standard North American automobile does and uh, it's pretty hard to get down to anything that looks like carbon or consumption, uh, carbon neutrality or consumption and drive a car. And not everyone can give up an automobile, which is why electrification and environmental standards are important. But it's those simple things that we each do in our lives. Whether or not we have enough runway left to solve, to, to, re, to send to this, our species on a different trajectory than the rather dismal one it's on right now relative to the environment, it isn't a question that we should start with. I think the question we start with, which is, what do you do in your life? I mean, I, one of the things I always found when we were at the National Roundtable doing these projections was I was asked by both Prime Minister Harper and Prime Minister Martin to come up with a plan to get to 70% reduction in CO2 emissions. 
And what we did is we, we induced this wedge system where we didn't measure the solution by abstract of ideas of you know, so much CO2, uh, percentage of CO2 in the atmosphere. We said sort of how many uh, people would have to drive an electric car or whatever it was. We measured it down, so we measured solutions. And we came up with a surprisingly great number of parallel alternate choices that we as Canadians could make. And well, the one thing that we said after we went through this whole exercise, that it was hardly sack and ash cloth, it was more, geez, this would be a much funner world to live in. It would be cleaner, we'd all be walking more, we'd ride bikes, we'd you know, live in much more, better, much more friendly, more organized neighborhoods. Uh, we couldn't find too much that looked like a very awful future when we did it. But you know, it might, if you ever get a chance to read James Howard Kunstler's The Geography of Nowhere, Back to Nowhere, he points out that you know, when every place looks the same, there's no such thing as place anymore. I mean, one of the things that we've done is slowly lost our identity and our character beyond the environment. But what, what, one of the big lies I think this often told is that we're somehow urbanizing. We're not urbanizing. We're de-urbanizing. De we've had a full frontal attack on urban and rural Canada. We're suburbanizing. You know, you know, you know, we now live in neighborhoods where you can't walk anywhere. You've got to use a liter of gasoline to get a liter of milk. If you do the math on that, you realize that's not good for you or the cow. Um, <laughs> You know, that we build neighborhoods, we each, when we buy a house, and you had some of them, it doesn't matter how climate change resistant they are, if they're that big, sitting on that much land, without a sidewalk, with, the, you know, with the cul-de-sacs and dead ends, and you, and you have to, you have three minivans and an SUV, you know, and, and a, a Mini Cooper just to make you feel good, um, in your front drive, you've sort of missed the boat. The physical structure of neighborhoods, which is why we brought in places to grow, which was actually to deal with the issues of connectivity and, pro and proximity and restore neighborhood main streets so that you could actually walk to get a liter of milk again. And if you ask yourself one fundamental question, it's quite easy. If you want to know whether your life is sustainable, one of the prerequisites for that is, can I walk to work? Can I walk to visit most of my friends? Can I walk to do my grocery shopping? And can I do most of my life without having to get behind an internal combustion engine to do it? Uh, and not just because of how green the engine is, it's electrical, but because of the amount of space, the volume of space. We're, we're living in about twice as much space as any other generation has. Do you know what I mean? We have empty rooms at home. Do you know what I mean? One of the reasons we have a condo boom going on downtown right now is because when all those kids leave, the empty nest, oh my God, that's a lot of vacuuming. I've got bedrooms full of dust bunnies where there used to be children. Um, so, so the, the, the re-intensification of the urban form is really important, but one of our, oh, I won't take that much time, don't worry, <laughs> thank you very much, though, is how much space do we use, how much infrastructure do we need to go from one place to the other, can we make choices that would get us in better shape, you know, get, give us smaller buttocks and thinner waistlines, which is my objective. Um, <laughs> total vanity, if you know anything else. And, and how, how, what are the kinds of things in our lives that are both reduce our consumption and our environmental footprint and improve our quality of life? We have now moved from the politics of hope and aspiration. We are moving away from politics where we see a world of possibilities and hope to a world of consumerism and taxpayers and selfishness and greed. Uh, people who will tell you, I've always found this great disconnect in Ontario with windmills. I don't think they're that terrible. The people who refer to them as industrial wind turbines are the same people who, you know, especially the local democracy, let's have, let's have everyone vote. Well, I'm all for that. Right after we get to vote on transmission lines locally. Have you ever been through rural Ontario lately, we've had 40, 50 years of these horrible, ugly things that, you know, are so aesthetically awful and, you know, and we actually know that living under them is not a good thing. Like, there's actually a lot of medical science that says this is not a good thing. You know, it, it's, it's, it's this relativism that's sort of amazing to me in the sense that putting up a windmill is a terrible thing, but having them along the side of a traffic freight clogged freeway is not a problem, or having big central nuclear plants and then having wires go through your neighborhood. I mean, it's just this kind of sense of double standard and intellectual dishonesty about that. So it's sad to me that we've seen, quite frankly, the relative decline of the Green Party in this province and, and there. Uh, that the, our government, which I think we have one of the greenest premiers in the history of this province, you actually get the Green Belt and you know the Green Energy Act and 
the massive investments we're trying to do with great difficulty in transit, you know, I think it's over $12 billion in subways and LRT right now. We get more attacked on green transit, green energy, and that than on any other issue. The biggest frontal assault from the organized corporate interests and the opposite, principal opposition party is on the green agenda. Uh, and that, to me, is one of the most failures, not only in politics, but the biggest failure of an opposition party is always supposed to be evidence-based. And if we do not close the gap between science and politics soon, and get back to evidence-based politics, based in real science, we are handing our children a legacy that we can be ashamed of.